Hello, coffee culture family. I am here today with Gregory Lay, and he is an actor, writer, producer, and small business owner. He was raised in New, New Jersey suburb right outside of New York City and attended Boston University Film School and the Neighborhood Playhouse School of Theater in New York City. He's appeared in numerous TV shows such as Law and Order SUV and Person of Interest and worked in feature films alongside Matt Damon and Richard Mazur. He has written a dozen commercials and two feature films, Lonely Boys and Hudson. We will get into that. And those are currently available everywhere. He writes, produces, and stars in his own TV show, Greg in LA, which kind of rhymes with Gregory Lay, which <laughs> has been in development across social media platforms. He also owns one of the most successful and up-and-coming cheesecake companies called Eastside Cheesecakes. And we'll find out what kind of coffee he has with it, which he started in 2020 when the world shut down. He works and lives in Los Angeles, California. So welcome, Gregory Lay. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't even know where to start because you are a multifaceted person. Um, but I just have to start by saying, I think I, I found you on Instagram and I thought it was sensational that you took advantage of the short form video and created a series out of it. And I've just been selling it left and right to people because it's funny and it's heart wrenching and oh, it's got, that. it's got so much, um, heart to it. But what I thought was brilliant was that you created two seasons and each episode's like a minute or two minutes long. Yeah. So like you can binge watch in like 20 minutes. <laughs> it's so great. It's, it's really, it's exciting to hear you say that because it was, you know, these things, they get created in a vacuum, you know what I mean? And especially at this point in, in my career, it was, you know, I've been, I've been hustling at the acting game for, for quite a long time and sort of had my side job. And you end up doing this because you, you love doing it. You know, at the end of the day, when you realize maybe you're not going to make a bunch of money overnight, you, you just start to get it, hopefully, for the love of the game. And so at this point, when I started that series, we were just you know, tired of waiting for the phone to ring. And, you know, that's sort of, that tends to be the lifestyle. But we had also, Sean and I, who, who co-created the show with me and does all the technical stuff, he's kind of a wizard. We've been collaborating for over a decade and we've always been about impulsive creativity. Growing up in New York, it was very easy for us to meet up at a moment's notice, shoot something. And, you know, when I moved here, we hoped we could do the same thing. And knowing without money that, you know, it's eyeballs now, right? Like we live in this attention economy, as a lot of people have said. So, you know, how do you get something like a creative work out to a large group of people without money or sort of a celebrity to sell it off of? And our hope was, is that if we make something that we love, that, that we're excited about, that maybe people would share that feeling. And because of that, that they would they might want to share it. Or, you know, because another thing that I, I realized is that there's really the value that people get for free on the internet, it's everything seems like a commercial for something now. Mm. Everything's like an advertisement for something else. Even if it's a show, it's an advertisement for a show that's, on, that's somewhere else or that you have to pay for or a product or somebody selling themselves <laughs> or their own identity, whatever it is. So to just know that because we love to do this, that we could offer people some entertainment, um, tell the story that we wanted to tell based on the feelings that, that we've had in our lives living so far and and uh, have people have the option to just enjoy something, you know, that's there for them specifically with no, with no tricks behind it, I guess. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love that um, we do have an attention problem because we've been um, groomed by social media to yeah. not last longer than seven seconds or 30 seconds or one minute. And then it's scroll, scroll, scroll to the next thing. Yes. So I thought it was brilliant actually that you created this series in that format, like in that short form. I mean, it immediately is TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube short <laughs> in because everything's like a minute. Yes. And that's, you know, I got to say, I'm really happy because I've always had sort of a, not a scattered mind, but I've always had a lot of things going on at once in my head. And the fact that now 
the output can match what's going on in terms of I can do multiple things at once. We, Sean and I have always made things very quickly, but we've always, we've always been able to, I guess, infuse more meaning into smaller bits, which to me is the essence of sort of a creativity writing. You want to be able to get a lot of information and a lot of, you know, and, and with film, you can do that through behavior and through dialogue. So to be able to know that, yes, this is how people are watching things now. Do I love it? No, because I came up on film and narrative and all these things I love about storytelling, but can you get the same essence across matched up with how people are watching things now? And the fact that, as you're saying, I mean, this is the most beautiful thing to hear this from you and to all these other people that, that, that is that to hear people say, wow, you're getting so much across in such a small uh, period of time is that it's, it's a music to my ears because that's the hope because that's all we have as far as I'm concerned before people scroll. So it's almost like you're not rejecting the way things are. It's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work with the way that things are, you know, and not fight it, not be bitter about it and be able to maybe infuse what I love to do with, with reality, you know, as it exists now. Well, you nailed it. You nailed it because we're all rooting for Greg. So you know what I mean? Like you, you, yeah. you achieved it. Uh, I don't know anybody who does not feel like some of the things you are going through in that, in as the character Greg in LA, like we, we can, we get it. <laughs> yeah. It's like you instantly tapped into so many different, uh, you know, things that we think about or things that we go through, you, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to dive into episodes. Like it's yeah, so that people really get it. So, you know, your wife leaves you and there you are in shock and you're watering your plants for like four hours straight. And you're like looking up at the sky, like, well, a plane went by. Is she in it? Will it crash? You know, like, you're just like, like, it's, it's what people go through. Like when they break up with somebody, you know, when they've been dumped, you yes. know, then all of a sudden you're thinking all of these horrible things. And, um, and I've been through that. That's the thing is, is, you know, the whole show was an exercise in vulnerability and honesty. And for me as an actor, I've always, always, always set the risk level at being able to be as vulnerable as possible, as honest as possible, because I, I believe in what I've seen proven is that if you do take that leap and you take that risk of exposing yourself in an honest way, so many other people have felt exactly like that. And that's oh, the risk definitely. everybody plays with not wanting to sort of share a lot about themselves as they see it as a weakness. But then there's this other side to it where people empathize and relate and feel connection based on that. So, so be, you know, living a life, going through things in my life, going through a divorce, you know, that, that kind of sort of those feelings of hopelessness and restructuring and, you know, uh, sort of, you know, the, the narrative that you told yourself your whole life, you know, these, these things come crumbling down and you have to rebuild them, right? So there's so much to work with there. And, and, and for me, I've always been a very analytical person. I've always analyzed exactly what's going on from the outside of my life to make sense of it from the time I was a kid. If it was, you know, made, made, getting made fun of or anything like that to feel better is understanding what, where it's coming from. So for me, that was sort of the way around, I guess the pain was, for, in anything was like, okay, if I can sort of understand what's going on, how I play a part and everybody else does. And I, it lends itself to writing because um, we put our stream of consciousness onto paper, Sean and I. And because he's so good at what he does, like a painter who can paint something directly from their mind right to their finger, because Sean is so technically proficient and we both have a very similar stream of consciousness, um, it can come right out and can come out quickly. We've shot four episodes in a day in one afternoon. That's yeah. Amazing. So, so that's our, I think that's our superpower is efficiency, speed, and meaning because it's, it's, it works now, right? Like it's so, yeah. So it, it, as you're saying it, you know, the, the, those relatable moments, they come from a, from a, from a real place. Yeah. Well, the, and I want to tap into that vulnerability. Um, you feel it immediately because he's walking down the road with a robe on and it's clearly a women's bathrobe with a cup mm -hmm. of coffee. He's walking yeah. down an LA street. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're like, you know, he's in a daze, you know, that he's there, you know, yeah. there's a certain kind of, there's a certain kind of thing that happens when you're in tragedy where uh, those like aesthetic 
or superficial things like you don't care. Like there's so much disorder in your regular life. Do you care if anybody sees you in a, in a woman's bathrobe? Do you know what I mean? It, right. It, 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 they just, it just goes out the window. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, kind of the flip side of that, like there's an episode where you're out on a date, like we are all rooting for you. You know, it's, it's, we see you with the robe, we feel you. And then we see mm -hmm. you trying so hard to like live a life, you know, you're, you're on the dating app and you are confused by that and you're out on the date and you're trying to Doing pick all, up all the things. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to pick up the cute woman who just hit your car. <laughs> We just, yeah, yeah. we just really want you to succeed. It's even Winston wants you to succeed. We got to talk yeah. about the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's my dog. That's my dog, Winston. Yeah. I saw I that. The rescue, yeah. Uh, yes, and you rescued another one, not to go off our conversation, but I just noticed on Instagram that you found another dog on the side of yeah, the road. Yeah, he's here a couple weeks ago, we were on the freeway and, and he was literally a four lane freeway and he was walking along the side of the road. Literally, there's no, no doubt he was going to hit my car. So at that point, we literally, so we stopped like three lanes of traffic and, I, and we got him into a box. He was trying to snap at us. But, you know, it's wild. Eventually you find out like the dog's house trained. Somebody took care of the dog, which, you know, to me makes me think who would care enough to tend to a dog and groom a dog. But then possibly just leave it on the side of the road, which people do when they get old because they don't want to take care of them sometimes. Oh, it's I hadn't thought about that. To think about, but, but yeah. So, uh, so he's here now. He he's visiting for a week, but it's amazing to see recovery, to see an mm -hmm. animal not trust and get, you start to just understand where that fear is coming from and to watch them turn a corner is kind of an amazing. It's an amazing thing. Well, you, you obviously love pets and you have yeah. um, Winston the cutest dog ever in your show. Best. He is so great. So I, you know, I know I posted, um, he's like the Yoda in your life That's true. <laughs> to Greg in LA. And I am so, I love those scenes where like you're walking down the road together and it's so perfect because you get to the end of the sidewalk and the light is don't walk. And you're having like the conversation with him and he's like getting literally like existential on you. you know? like, uh, yeah. And, and you are literally having the conversation with him and he's like, you know, she's, she's back there. She's, you know, she's in your rear view mirror. Like you have to go forward in life kind of thing. And, and then the light changes to walk and you're frozen there. Like it, it's so great. Like I'm, I, I know you, I love that you noticed that because there is, there's a lot of things that Sean and I, Sean and I came up on loving film and there's a lot of things that are said without dialogue. And I, I, I love that those, that those things come across. I'm yeah, very Winston, visual. <laughs> Winston is like, it, it, you know, it's like holding up a mirror to yourself. Dogs have this amazing ability. They just have love in their eyes. So, you know, it's sort of always right there to bounce off of you. And I, I, uh, I feel like he sort of, you know, in a way represents like his, you know, his, his conscience, his subconscious, unconscious, you know, his, 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 his better, his better, his better side. Yeah. It's, it's great. I, I love that. And I, um, I also want to talk about some of the, some of the funny things that really resonated with me on the show. I want everybody to just go watch all these episodes. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you some of the best morsels for me. So there was an episode with the influencer that you're like walking aimlessly and just, you know, trying to take in your surroundings and, you know, get some fresh air, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you walk up this mountain and there's this woman up there who's like recording herself. She's the, in and she tells you she's your, she's an influencer. And you're like, what's that? <laughs> Simple questions. <laughs> So it's kind great. of a wild thing because that 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 went crazy, which is that's very fascinating to me because that got like 3.2 million views. That video, that's the reason why I got 20,000 people watching the show is because of that one reel because it went all over the world. So wow. I watched this happen over the course of a week or two, and the engagement on that it was shared like 50,000 times or something. But it's it was the conversations what that culturally that represented something to people that they're witnessing now that they're seeing everybody has an opinion on influencers about what influencing is what it means to influence am i an influencer by even putting it up so it it really got people into this like philosophical 
uh, uh, back and forth. It was very fascinating. But once again, you know, you have an like, example of like, okay, so one piece of content or one clip goes viral, which brings people to a page that has two seasons of episodes, thankfully ready to go. It could have happened after a couple. So, I mean, it's kind of a wild thing that that just that one that that, that really spoke, it really spoke to a lot of people. It really did. We all connected with it because it's uh, a part of our language now. You know, um, I'm Gen X. So like when I was growing up, it was called, you know, the it factor or the X factor. Um, and now it's the influencer, right? Like yes. it's um and we could have a whole conversation. I literally just posted something on LinkedIn, the difference between an influencer and somebody with influence, um, which I think there's a big division yeah, on that. But, sure. um, but what I loved about that scene, what's, what stuck out especially was when she's holding the camera and telling everybody, um, hey, get out in nature, get off your phone. Da, da, da. And I'm like, she's on her phone in nature. <laughs> like, just... yeah. There literally is no parody anymore in <laughs> the world. Like it's all, it's all right on the surface now. So mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because people are so used to exchanging texts with each other and that the verbal sort of conversation has waned some with a newer generation, but it seems like, it seems like it, uh, like irony and parody are sort of like, you know, kind of the same as reality now. Exactly. Well, and, and it's such a great segue into the other influencer conversation that you ended up having in the office. So Mm -hmm. the CEO who's like 12 years old, I think actually I ran that link on uh, LinkedIn because there's such a huge um, startup economy. um, And there's a lot of really young people that are like instantly CEOs, right? Because they're starting up all of these different companies. So for me to see like a 12 year old being the CEO, that that was hysterical, hysterical. And then I couldn't stop laughing because I've also done posts on acronyms and people overuse them and they don't even know what half of them mean. And we've, we're trying to like shorten how we talk to people, but it's making it harder because people don't even know what you mean. You know, like they just don't get it, but that was hysterical. I'm thinking Sean got that because I, I was not in that, that life to know personally, because right off the bat, I I was just waiting tables and sort of pursuing acting, but Sean in commercial meetings. And especially now he has more of like a solid commercial job that, that, that ended up being real. That ended up being something that people actually directly related to because it was kind of like almost our idea of what it might be like. You know what I mean? It's absolutely. (laughs) It is. I have been to cocktail parties where, you know, I'm talking to people who are like maybe VC community or tech or sales or whatever. And. Oh yeah, for sure. They just start dropping. They start dropping acronyms all like salt and peppered through their whole conversation that I'm losing the, the string of, of understanding what they're saying. Cause I'm sitting there trying to figure out what, what, what does that mean? Like what I couldn't look it up on my phone. Like that's actually are- a really funny scene. That would be a really funny scene to be at like a, a party and two people are speaking completely different language. Yeah. Slowly just creep out. Cause you have no idea what they're talking about. It's really awkward. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even think about that, but that's, yeah, this is a whole new language is forming. Well, if I see that episode, I'm going to take credit for it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and another another episode, which I thought was really funny, like you take a riff on life. So you're at the farmer's market and you get approached by somebody who um, wants to petition to m- for to help migrate whales to cold killer waters. Whales, yeah. Killer whales, that's it, killer whales. And it's so funny because it's it's so true like no matter what farmer's market you go to there is always somebody holding up a petition for one thing or another oh yeah they're covering the place yeah Yeah. it's a uh it it, it, to me it's it's interesting because it's one of those fascinating things to me about people um they're doing something but they have no idea what they're really doing Mm -hmm. and it's like yes signed up for this and i'm doing this i'm asking you a question i'm asking you for something but i don't even really know what it is that i'm doing (laughs) <laughs> I thought it was- you, you guys, you nailed it again. I mean, I, I don't know how long you took to film that, but you, you nailed that one. It was really funny. I, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things too, where you realize it makes you a little sad. You're like, wow. It's like, you know, people need jobs. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We really do, right? Like yeah. whatever, I'll hold the clipboard and I'll just, I'll ask for the killer whales, yeah. <laughs> um. So I'm, I wanna go back in time a little bit and yeah. um, because you did produce with Sean, I believe, um, and along with uh, two of the uh, actors that you've worked with before, David Neil Levin and Paul Mazur. So you also- oh, Richard, pre- Richard Mazur. Yeah. Richard, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay, um, it's okay. um, Lonely Boys and Hudson. Yes, yes. And a third movie, actually, that probably should come out soon. I'll tell you about later. But I re- yeah, I worked with Richard a lot. who was one of my childhood, like these stars that I watched as a character actor growing up in all these 80s movies. So it was kind of a, it was a wild thing to work with him. Yeah, I definitely want to chomp into that. Um, so sort of this funny thing. So when I first queued up Hudson to watch it, I'm thinking... Hudson Valley, because like you, New York, because of where you're coming and walking, and I'm seeing like the leaves changing on the trees along the water. So I'm thinking the Hudson River, the whole thing. But it was actually the character's name in it, <laughs> so I was yes. thrown off at first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but which also both, you know, totally mm-hmm. both because that's where Sean's from, Syracuse. So we basically were around oh, that, and just the upstate okay. New York area. Mm-hmm. And Hudson Valley in general, that's actually where Richard lives. Um, okay. So you totally frequented that place. So that was the, totally the idea. Yeah. And we're, and, and we're going to go back to your Northeastern roots because that's where I'm from as well. But um, I have to ask. Yeah. One of the um, the people in the movie that, of course, we don't meet is Beth Elizabeth. Elizabeth yeah, yeah, Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the person that divorced you and left you in Greg in LA is Beth. What's with Beth? You know what? It just it just ended up being something we're like we just thought it would be silly. And it's the same that it's the same that it's the same person, the same name. Uh, and then David even said he's like, "Is this?" He's like, "We you know." He's like, "Oh wait, is Greg in LA the sequel to Hudson?" And we're like we're like that's actually really really funny. But no, we just honestly, yeah, it was the same name. And Sean put it in the script and we just, uh, honestly, we just thought it would be funny. It's funny that you made that connection too. I'm sure more people will. I think they will. I think they will. (laughs) I just thought it was like a cute aside. I just had to find out about that. So your roots are in the Northeast. Um, We both talked about that. You uh, spent some summers on the shoreline of Connecticut and Mm -hmm. you went to school in Boston. so this is where you met Sean, who's your producer now, maybe, and Richard Mazur and David Neil Levin, like oh, is know, these people? It was, you know, it was, it was an interesting journey because I went to BU right out of high school and, you know, you're getting your bearings. I had no idea what I was doing. And I did some, some theater while I was there, but I, went, I, I mainly focused this terms of my studies on filmmaking which, you know, back then I was learning how to like cut actual film on a machine. Like there was no digital hadn't really started yet. So it was, Gen was X. The last generations to like cut and tape physical film. <laughs> and then two years later, it was obviously the entire school had changed. But um, I took a year after that and I went and then I decided to go to acting school and it was acting school for two years, which was a very immersive conservatory. Like I took ballet and modern dance and voice and speech. And it was like a very immersive program. And then it was really after that, that I got the ground running and decided that I was going to kind of go at it myself, kind of break free of the structure of any of these programs or continue to go to school and just sort of hit the pavement. And it was doing tons of plays for free off Broadway and doing tons of student films. And, and, you know, from the beginning, which, you know, I got, it's another amazing thing is I, I knew that I was really passionate about acting, but I also knew there was somebody out there that was just as passionate about the filmmaking aspect. I just wasn't. I went to film school, I think, because I wanted something quote unquote more stable than just theater school. Mm-hmm. Whatever that was, I was getting a, a bachelor's. Um, and so, you know, when I finally uh, decided to uh, to go to acting school and sort of like, you know, pursue that, it was, it was kind of like just a chaotic drive into into the unknown. But then I I said to myself, I need somebody. I need somebody who who ha- understands that technical aspect. That's a master at that. That needs an an actor writer partner. Mm. 
and I met a man, named, a guy named Dan Simon first, and we made this movie Lonely Boys together. And him and I were our first immersive writer, director thing. And we made an entire movie for like $6,000, a feature film around New York City with actors doing us favors, locations doing us favors, taking over people's houses and just on the scheme of just wanting to create a feature, our first feature. And it, it wasn't until a little later, I, I started to do a little uh, like spec commercial. These spec commercials started to come up where you basically, you know, could enter these contests by doing brand commercials through these companies. And that's how I actually met Sean. And we did a few commercials, like spec commercials together. And slowly he started to ask me to do short films. And we started, we just came up together. So that was like 10 years ago where I ended up getting two, two collaborators actually come into my life that were masters uh, of directing and, and camera that loved shooting and also writing who could edit as well, who could, were amazing editors, who could, from top to bottom, we could put together a movie ourselves. With, you know, if, the, if, the, if the surroundings were right and natural light was there with a couple microphones and just people, one camera, we, we could make a movie, you know, because normally you need five, six people on a set, you know, you need people that know lighting, but if you have somebody who knows lighting, sound, camera, directing, can write, I mean, it's rare, but because of that, Sean and I kind of became this two-man team. And Hudson, we ended up basically wanting to write something around David, me 11, because he's such an interesting character to us. I had worked with him on another feature that I actually, I met David on a feature called Crazy Famous. I know it's a little round and round, but that was like an actual legitimate multi-million dollar movie that I booked as an actor, met nice. David and brought him into the fold because Sean was like, this guy's very interesting. So we wrote something. And up until the week before we went to upstate New York, David did not think we were gonna make the movie because it was like a credit card dropping, you know, it cost us like tens of thousands, but next to nothing. So it was, it was me, Sean, the actors we loved and knew and trusted and a, a DP, a director of photography that we loved. And some, so we paid all our crew. They worked for a really, you know, they did us a favor by working for a good rate. Actors worked for free for the love of the game. Sean and I worked for free. We took over his mother's house in upstate New York and Syracuse. She cooked for everybody. We apparently during September, it's unheard of. We got 10 straight days of sun. Crazy things happened. We shot at a gas station that was supposed to be ripped out of the ground the next day, but he called and the guy had this, the location for us. All these wonderful things happened, but we shot that in 10 days, um, a feature film in 10 days for barely any money. And that was, it was huge for us to do that. So once Sean and I went through that, this Greg in LA thing was just sort of a fun project, mm -hmm. you know, because it was, what can we do for nothing for zero? So, you know, the response, I mean, the fact that you're, that you're even asking me questions about it is, it's kind of <laughs> remarkable, you know, because it was just for fun, you know, but Sean being a commercial director, he's so aesthetically specific that anything that he makes is going to, he's going to make sure that it's, it's beautiful, you mm -hmm. know, the page is beautiful, that it looks, so if you have those, those elements, I feel like you can kind of do anything, especially now, right, with the resources being what they are. Absolutely. It's, it's great that you complemented each other so well. Yeah. Um, we share a brain too. Our ideas, we have a shorthand. We don't really have to discuss much. We understand the same stuff without really saying it. He can say like, make a move. And I know exactly kind of what he wants me to do. It's, it's something that just gets developed over time. So it's another thing you can't just sort of make up on the spot. You can't buy that. It only right. develops over time, which, you know, you feel, I feel lucky. So he finishes your sentences. He's like your work husband. Yes. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's cutting mm -hmm. out the little man in anything is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that, Hey, do you want to go do this? Damn. We got to do this first and that first. And by that time, to me, the emotional energetic momentum of things is one of the most important things. You know, you try to like, I, I try to like cultivate that in other people. You know, you find out through actors or other people, what it is that makes them tick, what it is that makes them, you know, light up. And if they need that, especially, you know, you don't know what any, what's going on in anybody's life. So it's, it's good to be close with somebody. So there's like, there's no, there's no bullshit. You know what I mean? mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
I think, um, you know, what I could say where I, I have this in common with you is, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. It's essentially what you've been. Um, I just and you realized have, that, by the way. I didn't yeah. know that. I just realized I was. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have to be very gritty and agile. Yeah. And, you know, I've been planning, I've been doing all sorts of things throughout my life too. I, you know, I'm multifaceted. I, before I was a podcaster, I was doing marketing and, and small intimate events. And I was a jewelry designer for, for 15 years. Like I've done a lot of different things. Yeah, both parts of your brain working. Exactly. Oh, so, yeah. you know, you know, oh, that's, very, that's it. I think that's the key. I'm sorry. I heard it dropped you, but I love that you're you're saying this right now. Yeah. Well, that's why I think I I notice so many details. I'm extremely visual. Um, But you have to work fast and you have to work efficiently with what you have. And I've always done that. And I think it's so cool. It's a testament to the creative that you're able to do this almost seamlessly. It's almost like you don't want to go bigger necessarily, like bringing other people in because it's going to like, ruin the recipe. What, what would it, this is the question I ask myself, what is, what is life if it, if it truly is about the creative process? What if it really is about the art? What if you don't have another agenda? What if you aren't looking for the money or the attention? What if you go to that place? And I think to me, the only reason that I'm here now is because, I mean, I've made changes in my life that were massive. I mean, I stopped drinking alcohol when I was like 36 years old. I had so much um, energy that I didn't know what to do with it and nobody taught me. So a lot of what allows me, I think, to do what you're describing and sort of, you know, do all of this at once quickly and efficiently is I asked myself a question and this series of magical events happened when I moved to LA that really challenged me in a way, the way I wanted to be challenged, um, that I, I immediately, I think after going through what I went through you know, I asked myself, what would it be like if you were the most reliable person in the room? What would it be like if you weren't looking for somebody else to kind of like close up shop? What if everything fell on your shoulders? Because I had the energy to do it, but it was scary. And I had always partied a lot and kind of burnt, burnt my fuse that way and worked hard at the same time, but I wasn't optimal. I was like, you're a happy person. You have a lot of joy in you, but you're sort of going in this direction where like, what if that energy went in the other direction? It took years, it took a decade as far as I'm concerned, because when I was 26 years old and I got out of acting school, I knew I had to make changes. I was like, there's no way you succeed like this. I know how this story ends. You burn yourself out and best mediocrity, for, you'll know it and you'll be looking back going, it's the same old drag of a story about somebody who just indulged too, too much, whatever. And then by the time I was 36, I had gone back and forth and back and forth so much of a year, stopping for a year, running marathons, like going to extreme, like in order to fill that void. And then obviously over time, you learn to calm down a little bit. You learn to balance. You learn that you're just as energetic and fascinated about information and knowledge and experience. So if you fill yourself with that, then it's all started to take off. Then then I started to, because the fulfillment it doesn't matter what happens on the outside. Like, I got this. Sean and I working together at the end of the day, everything else is just gravy. Like, it's just extra. The accolades, the money, you know, to find a, a, a space where you're doing it for those sort of grounded, pure reasons and you're enjoying that about life. I mean, that to me is the prize. But culture has you chasing all kinds of stuff that it does not do it. And You can run into a wall your whole life because you can always switch. The brain is so clever. It's amazing because you can tell yourself the most intricate story in order to go around what's right in front of you, which is this is not working. Like, but the fear of change, the, the, the exhaustion that comes with changing momentum as you get older, stopping, taking a moment, then changing direction. It's like the biggest nightmare in the world for people. So because like what you said about agility and, and being, um, versatile, you know, that, that was chaos for me at one point and being in, I, cause I always was like, you know what, if I'm going to be an artist, if I'm going to be an actor, all the actors I love are kind of wild cards. So I also emulated that lifestyle, which was, which was destructive, which was definitely what I was doing because I associated that with great, like guttural heartfelt talent and like expression, like these people, like, like Sean Penn and like these guys who were like really, but 
eventually you just sort of learn that like, oh, these are human flaws. These are like, I understand why people depend on those states in order to get where they are, but, but um, you know, it, 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 culture sort of told me to follow a certain thing and chase a certain thing for fulfillment. And I'm just lucky I kind of broke the pattern before um, I felt like there was no, nowhere else to go, I guess, you know? Gregory, that was like a mic drop. <laughs> I have to tell you, that was beautiful. I, I feel what's really, really important is that you recognized that all you need is to allow yourself to create and it doesn't really matter about anything oh. else or anyone else and who cares about the future it's it's going to play out the way it's going to play out and and you can't direct that you can only direct your art yes and uh i think what that's that really control cool. over you know like what people put so much control in other people's hands and they don't even realize it in other circumstances, hands and outside circumstances. It's the end of the day. Like if you really understand that you really do, and this is such a cliche, right? Because you'll hear from every guru, everybody, every self-help that, you know, you only have control over the things, you know, you know, over yourself, over your reactions to things. But when you really understand that you catch yourself, right? You mm -hmm. catch yourself constantly more and more to where hopefully you can kind of eradicate those, those little missteps, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's, a uh, also like here, even hearing you relate to it, even hearing you understand it, I think it's so important because all I see now, I mean, I bartended sober for two years in New York before I moved to LA. That's impressive. Like, unbelievable. Like, wow. I, you end up having these therapy sessions with people who they smell something on you. It's very interesting. They know they, you know, a bartender as well. So they go for you to ask you questions, but people that want to change their lives and they want you to know that they're, they want to change their lives, but they're kind of in this helpless place. You know, people that are coming in, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to go out and take you on some bender with them only for you to find out that they just had some fight with their ex-wife and they weren't able to see their kid. And now mm -hmm. they're like looking to destroy themselves and they want to take you with them, which is some iteration of always what's going on. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it gives you eyes. It gives you the ability to see people very quickly, I think, and say, oh, what, what you're saying to me right now and what you're actually going through are two very different things. You know, you're, you're upset, you're sad, you're hurting, even though you're yelling and screaming. And I mean, I'm working on it every day. I by no means have it figured out, trust me, because I lose my temper all the time, but it's, but it's you one know, of those things. I think that's culture though, like culture and uh, social media, you know, we all know it's Instagram worthy, right? It's the, the picture, it's the dialogue, it's the writing, everything people put on there, um, in some cases is a facade. Like it's not really who they are or what they want to do. Um, it's not feeding their heart. Um, it's, it's not their, um, hi, Winston. I hear you back there. <laughs> Sorry, one second. No, no. All right. Could be mailman, could be anybody. We don't know. That's all right. No worries. I got one too. He might start barking, right. uh, but it's, you know, it's hard to be your creative individual self. You know, it's really hard. Um, and you saw it like in real time at a bar, you know, that's like an Instagram moment where somebody's trying to show you how strong they are or how angry or whatever, but inside they're like this little child crying because, you know, they lost the love of their life and they had, you know, their mom had walked out with the, on them when they were younger. So it's, you know, the same thing, same, yeah. same. And that's yeah. why they're at the bar. Um, but it's, uh, it's amazing. People, I think, want authentic. You know, I think that there's something going on where, like you said, there's so much of this posturing, there's so much of this facade-driven existence. It, it just seems to me, I know I am, like, I, I know maybe the response to the show in some small way is like, you know, it, people are starting to become aware of it. Maybe they're becoming, God willing, becoming a little bit more self-aware, a little bit more aware of you know, the fact that like everything that we have in culture was built on top of real things. Like it's, it's, you know, at the, at the very basics, we're very, very simple 
creatures at the end of the day, like we all want the exact same things, but so much work is done to like differentiate, but take everything away, the clothes, the hairstyle, I mean, everything, everything. It's really, I mean, it's amazing how lost we get in the story. And it's, I mean, it's all a story really when you build up from the bottom, but you can tell yourself any real, anyone you want, it really is. That's what seems to what people forget that somewhere the story started, right? It started mm -hmm. somewhere. And, it and you convinced really yourself of it, right? You and convinced you're born yourself. you into a story, you mm -hmm. know, and you're already mm -hmm. convinced in your formative years before you even have a choice. So to me, it's like my, 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 a guy I know, and maybe somebody else has put it this way, but it was really brilliant that everybody's born running software. Like they're, by the time mm -hmm. they're six or eight years old, they have a program running in their head. And then maybe you realize and recognize that you have certain programs automatically running inside of you. And then you actually take a moment to realize what those are. And then you might be able to shift them or shut them down or change them into other programs. But Or you get a therapist and they help you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> to figure them out, right. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like I've... I've always, I think, been very interested in, in, in that machinery. So I think that's how I was able to stop like drinking and things like that, right? Because mm -hmm. I went underneath it all. Personally, I can speak for myself. It, it was one of those things where I felt like if I understood what was driving it personally, then I, I knew that I enjoyed life regardless. And I, I was obsessed with the idea that That's like, important. there are these things that we do all the time that um, we just sort of do by habit. You don't really ask yourself like, well, how does it feel when you don't? How does it feel when you do? So for everybody, it's, it's really, it's a very personal thing, but just to like, I guess, self-awareness, right? That's what we're talking about. That's very mm -hmm. powerful. I agree. I agree. Um but the other side of that, your entrepreneurial spirit, I love your, um, that you have found that creativity is the only thing you need to eat. Um, and thankfully it lined up, right? Because yeah. there is that, you know, lining up with what you can sell, right? What, how you can make money in this world, that magical combination of like something you can be passionate about, which will just by virtue of doing it will generate money if you build the house properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, the cheesecake company that, that we started it, 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 I came to LA and I knew that I needed kind of a kick in the ass to be a little bit more, I'd never been in a regular, I had worked really hard, but to know that I could like run as a, like a management figure, like come in every day, work cr crazy hours if need be, be the guy to be relied on, never miss a day of work. I had never really, because I, I, waiting tables, getting off, partying, going out on auditions, like this whole New York thing. When I got to LA within two weeks, crazy thing. I was in a parking lot. Well, we had been in LA for two weeks. We need, I needed a job. I had no idea what I was going to do. Sick of waiting tables, bartending. For like 15 years, I had done it. And I was like, uh, more and more, maybe 20. 30 different restaurants and bars I had worked at every possible position. You know, I quit and started again a lot because of acting. If I get a part, be like, oh, started, gotta go. Mm -hmm. but, but I needed a change, like psychically, like spiritually needed a change. Like I had hit a wall with that and I was, I had milked it for everything I could in every possible way. And listen, it's, it's a rude awakening going on set, doing a movie with Matt Damon for two weeks. You're, you're like out over the moon. It's the dream. And then you're waiting tables like a week later. Because I can so relate to this it's right now. It's supposed to change, right? Right, 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 right. My whole life's supposed to change. I know. To rocket launch. And then I'm asking somebody which soup they want. And I'm like, this is it. This is a life moment, Greg. Back to reality. Yes. Oops, yes. there goes gravity. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. You're like, you're like, this is the exact, this is, I have to be okay with this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was its own learning, uh, learning experience, but man, in LA two weeks needed a job. My girlfriend goes inside to get bagels. Cause we had heard that bagels are kind of bad in LA. So <laughs> and coming from in. the East coast, you had to test that. Oh God. Obsessed with bagels, <clears throat> being a, a Jewish guy from the East coast, of course. So I, so I, uh, she went in and, and while she was there, she was looking on Craigslist and under like miscellaneous jobs, she found this bagel job. This guy needed a bagel baker. And I, 
had been thinking about making bagels for the last couple of years. It was just something that always, and then I find out later, I was in some meeting a year before and some guy goes, hey, Greg, what are you going to do in LA? And I go, eh, I'll probably learn to make bagels or something. Crazy, right? Wow. So this isn't even the bagels. She didn't even look up bagels. It's under the miscellaneous jobs. I call the guy. I have this idea. This is my job. This is my job. I could d- dive into this. If this is just me learning how to make bagels ends up, I was really uh, uh, convincing. I meet with him. He hires me. I spend the next two and a half years. Don't miss a day of work. Ne- I, I don't take a break. I'm there 15 hours a day sometimes, sometimes sun, sun up to sundown for two and a half years straight, learn how to make bagels. He opens up two more locations. It becomes this huge bagel place. We're in the New York Times for like the, the bagels. Are they the best bagels in LA or New York? So it's crazy. I'm the guy behind the guy. So he's on Jimmy Kimmel and all this crazy stuff is happening. But I was making cream cheese from scratch while I was there. And when the pandemic happened, you know, it's sort of every everything became fair game. It was kind of like, it leveled the playing field in this way for me psychologically, where it was a positive thing, where I was like, wait, everybody's in the same boat. So everybody's always in the same boat, really. Mm -hmm. It's just all this machinery moving that really makes you, it's very intimidating. It squashed the hierarchy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was like, if if this man ran, ran a business and I can run his business, then I can start my own. So Julia had like a, my, my, my girlfriend had a, who's my fiance now, she had a, uh, she, she had like a paycheck, a one an unemployment check, and she got a mixer off Craigslist and we started making cheesecakes. And then I decided like a year, a little over a year ago to leave and just go full on. It was a huge risk. And now we're like, it's sort of this big up and coming thing. And, and we're probably going to do QVC and it's nuts. It really is. And it, and it, it just happens. It happened very quickly, but when I think about it, it was literally the hardest I've ever worked in my life. I was, it was the way it was. It wasn't like I was sitting there complaining. It was like, I could jump into this, this, as this part of my life right now, I could immerse myself in this and have like, and just enjoy it. It was, there was a flow. So for that, the last three, four years, it was like, put me in this place where I have this, this cheesecake company, which I make with fresh cream cheese, which we're both super passionate about and it's kind of taken off. So, I mean, it's, it's wild. It's been a wild ride. That's crazy. I, do you sell bagels there as well, or it's just cheesecake? Coming soon. It's, that's a, that's okay. a complicated operation. So. Oh, okay. All right. Think, so it's just a cheesecake. I see that in the future for sure. But yeah, just the cheesecake for now and cream cheese. We're selling fresh cream cheese now too, like a few different varieties. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You know, it's, um, so again, here's that entrepreneur and your agility and creativity, all shining great big lights. I see them behind you. You know, there's the angel sure. behind you. It's just, um, I, I had gone to a conference and seen, um, and, and got the pleasure of meeting Mark Cuban and, mm. and he had said something that has resonated with me time and again. And I think it's going to really resonate with you. So he had said, forget ready, aim, fire, Mm. because if you're constantly shaping what you're aiming at, you just don't start just ready, fire, aim, just get started, do it, make the cream cheese, make the cheesecake, build the film, you know, go grab that crazy job and just see what happens. Like just do the thing. Yes. And then you can aim a little bit later, you know, like you could decide, okay, these cheesecakes, we're going to have, um, you know, many stores now, or we're going to sell them frozen, whatever that'll all come later. Just do the thing. It's such good, it's such good advice. It is. It's it's such good advice because for me, it's interesting you say that because I realized like that was the thing I had no problem with was the, was the, the just go but I needed to form that little bit of structure. You need a bit, you need like a, a, in the back of your head, Mm -hmm. you almost need like a monitor or like a concept that's framing things. But that's kind of what I needed. It's like bringing shape to what, to what you said, that instinct to just say, I'll just do it. I feel like um, uh, if you measure, if you measure that properly, it's kind of unstoppable in a way. Mm -hmm. It seems Mm -hmm. that way because, because you're, the best elements of yourself are just sort of right there. And they're sort of being put right out there 
to the test. And as you said, because it also takes so much in the beginning and there is a lot of, uh, a lot of it can be disheartening. So you almost need to have that sort of wild energy just to burn through all of the missteps and the, the disappointments. Well, if you, if you just use the passion and you just fire and go, I mean, I have myself, I don't want to make this about me, but I just, you know, I've pivoted a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think why that resonated with me so much is I am the queen of ready fire aim. I have never done the classical business model. I've never built, you know, the, the, you know, the business plan and went to the bank and took the, like, I've never done it. So what was way. your first, what was your first, like out of the gate kind of big, you're like, I'm just going to do this. Uh, I would probably say the jewelry design business, which just, did you come from a background in jewelry or nope. just like jewelry? I just liked it. And I, it was kind of funny how I started. I had a, my belly pierced uh -huh. and, um, I wanted a belly ring that was for me. I, you know, I wasn't 16. I wasn't, you know, Britney Spears you know? <laughs> and I wanted something that had a little sophistication to yeah. it. Um, so I went and I took a jewelry class and I made my own belly ring. And then I made a bunch of them and went to a store and asked them if they were interested in carrying them. Like and the Sarah Blakely approach. You just yeah. went straight, straight out. That's exactly. That's yeah. I love that. And she carried some of my stuff. And every time I made something new, I brought it to her and she carried it and she sold it and would give me my check. And then I went to um, another store uh, with a collection and I sold to them. And when I went back to the first store, I said to her, thank you for giving me a start and believing in me. Um, I just sold my first wholesale collection to this other boutique. Mm -hmm. And um, I thank you for that. And I'd love to, you know, Get, get some more stuff to you. And she said, bring me some stuff. So I brought it and she said, now you're in business. I'm going to take a wholesale order from you. Cause before she just did it on consignment. Cause she was just mm -hmm. trying it out. So, um, yeah, wow. I just, I got into it the business a lot for you. Doesn't it? in that moment, <laughs> the realization that you have in that moment by succeeding, it's sort of to know that that's possible. And it was all you Mm -hmm. You know, that's the, that's a, that's such a huge thing. And when I got out of acting school, I remember it was the same. My whole thing was, you know what, everybody goes to coaches and audition coaches. And to me, I, I immediately said to myself, I love movies so much. I feel like I have a grasp on this. I go, what if I go to a workshop or whatever, where I have to audition for like what, somebody who, who casts real things. So they've been in front of these big actors. They're going to tell me straight, but I'm not going to go to a coach. I'm not really going to follow the rules. I'm going to go in and I'm just going to do something that I believe I'm good at. Because my thought was, if I get green lit after that, then I, all this pressure that I'm not good enough yet, that seems to always like take people over. Yeah, like that's I that imposter syndrome teacher, thing. This mm -hmm. coach. I knew people who would go to a coach before every single audition to tell them how to say things. And I'm like, but how are hmm. you going to really figure out your own music that way? Because oh, this is all so just- well throwing it, you know, over and over until it takes shape, right? Like you, you, what you were describing. So in order to get that shape, I need to be, get feedback on the decisions I've made that came from my own head so that within me, they're going to take a different shape. And then also I can be like, I'm good enough. Like if this person says that I did a pretty good job and I realize what the landscape is, and it's a matter of like other logistical things, Getting over that validation phase is one of the, I think, I think that takes people over forever. It always seems to me that like you spend all this time in the beginning, simply just trying to prove to yourself that you're good enough, like, so that you think you're good enough just so that you can move on to the actual work of working, not being yeah. like, are you watching this? Does that person that I respect think that like, I'm doing a good job? Do they respect what I'm doing? As opposed to like, what if it literally comes from your own self-belief? And then you start to see reactions around you. And then it means just go in that direction, right? Just continue in that direction. Your instincts are good enough. Like what a, what a great thing to learn. Yeah. I, I think what I gather from that is um, don't, you can get stuck in the mud when you are um, constantly asking for permission 
yeah. and validation. Yeah. Then you never fire. That just means you're in constant aim. You're constantly yeah. Yeah. aiming and you yes. never, yeah. you never do the thing. Um, but, you know, like I said, you know, I, I did the jewelry that I, I had been planning some of the world's largest events prior to that. Like there was no connection to the two. Wow. And, um, you know, even with podcasting, I, I created the podcast in three weeks. I went to YouTube university. I figured it out. You know, it's not, um, I think sometimes you just got to do the thing. Starting. That's it. Isn't that the craziest thing? It's that those first few steps are so daunting. They, they, they hold within them almost all the doubt, all the imposter syndrome you were talking about. You're, you're, there's this mold that you're trying to like break. It's a very interesting thing, but it's, it says, it seems to me that like, you know, that's, it keeps you in a very predictable program, doesn't it? All of that. It keeps you kind of predictable in your behavior because the more that you kind of stay in that channel, the more you're most likely going to continue in that channel with uh, and not break out of what you're used to, like you did. Because the first thing I think about is 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 the sort of the the real the, you know the same realization I had where you went to do jewelry. So now you're using this other part of your brain, this designer sort of right right aspect of your brain, which is feeding the other side in another dimension that you might not be able to articulate, but mm -hmm. you guarantee it's happening. Yes, it informs so, your work in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah. And, texture, whatever it is. And I, and I would say that imposter syndrome is, can be another form of procrastination really. Mm. Yeah. Um, you just got to do the thing. You just got to make the cheesecake. Well, what happens right? after that? Isn't that always the fear? Like, okay. Like I spent all my time thinking about starting now you've started. Now you're back kind of at the beginning and you have to go like, what is it about now? It was, it was about starting. Now it's not about starting anymore. Now it's about actually, now I have to continue, I guess, because you could sit there all day, right? And aim, as you said. Yeah. Well, People you stay with it as long as it feeds you creatively and that you enjoy it. And when you stop, maybe that's when you're going to sell the, the cheesecake. I yeah. don't know, you know, yeah. to somebody else, but you know, I, I also have to say that um, I'm going to circle this around somehow to coffee culture. What kind of coffee do you drink with your cheesecake? <laughs> well, the co I, honestly, I like that was terrible. Like flavor it was a beautiful transition. It was a great segue. The <laughs> the um, I like something not acidic. Does anybody like acidic coffee? Some people must. I mean, is it or is that not ideal? I like smooth, mm -hmm. dark, rich uh roasts so pete's i love pete's coffee mm. I love pete's. I've had, I've had that's them. california it's mm -hmm. a colombian single source coffee that's what i'm drinking right now interesting and i use a i was using a percolator for a long time i really that's old it. school yeah that was making really nice coffee now i have this like sort of typical coffee maker but french press was was sort of typically i love french what press. i went with the most of the time yeah i like it because it's there's like a ritual to me Yes. with French press. And it feels, I love that. It's not mechanical in some way. Like it, it's just, fact. yeah. Like that. it's so easy, you know? Yeah. I started using the coffee maker and it's, it becomes a little bit of a reckless, like, ah, just pour a cup of coffee. It's not like you said, the ritual kind of goes away. It's not as special, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of like mechanically, robotically pouring into this pot. So maybe you can, um, make, and sell coffee alongside your cheesecake. Yeah, there's definitely a few things that, uh, the thing about that the company is, and it's very interesting just to hear people's offers and just in general, like people sell things to you that it, it's so important. As, as we were talking about before, even with sort of the, doing something creatively for sort of the pure act of itself, it's all about maintaining the beauty of the product and about and the, the purity of and the flavor of the product. And you realize why people skim and save money and then eventually whittle away at the, the reason why their product is special, is really, really special. So yeah. it's like, yeah, we would definitely love to do that, but we would probably work with somebody local who brews a nice coffee. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. I love the, that. That's the best part about this is you can really, you know, uh, we got into this with a lot of help from other people uh, during 2020 that were, you know, popping a tent up and just sort of having at it. 
So there's a lot of success stories that actually came out of that time of people that just were looking for a way to make money and started a food business, a burger place or, yeah. So it's really is neat. It, is yours just to go, like people just show up to like the bakery shop and they take it and they go away or do you have like seating? It's, we don't have a retail space yet. We have a, a big like commissary kitchen that we bake everything out of and store everything in. And then we ship uh, on Gold Belly, which is like a, a nationwide shipping platform. So we ship uh, overnight on dry ice. So every day I'll go in and we'll just like kind of put packages together and send those out to everywhere all over the country. And then there's local delivery and pickup. And um, you will do pop-ups and events every now and again too. So mm -hmm. we try to cover all the bases. Cool. Very yeah. cool. Well, I'll, I'll make sure to put all that information in the show notes so people can order a cheesecake oh, from you. But I, I definitely want to uh, tap into season three, Greg in LA. I, yes. I heard it's coming because you got such an overwhelmingly beautiful response to seasons one and two. Again, oh, yeah. 100%. everybody watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were going to. Dude, oh, sorry, sorry. Keep going. No, no. I just want like season three. Like I'm so excited. And are you staying with the format? You're not going longer format. I think we're going to, you know, I think it's important that regardless, we just continue Yeah. because you know, there's buzz and like, there's a couple, you know, there's a couple of people that wanted to talk to us about it, but like, you know, it's the way the town works. So it was about us just making it, you know, it, it, literally the show being made is revolves around uh, our work schedules and Sean having enough time to come up for air when he gets hit with all these commercial jobs that he's doing if he's traveling for them it really is just a matter of us being free and then we'll just dig into it and then start releasing it very soon the time between shooting it and releasing it to give you an idea like most of the time we'll shoot the next day it's edited and aired hmm, so it's it, like my podcast it's kind of like yeah it's manageable yeah, he his headphones on he does it and we're sort of ready to keep going, which is good because it, it sort of the episode can in and of itself kind of be precious, but it's not like we don't like stay precious with it. And then sort of, you know, we decide we like it and then we kind of just move on to the next one. So, yeah, definitely without a doubt, season three. Um, well, that's great because you don't have much ego wrapped around it. It sounds like you're just no, having fun. No, no, no. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Which is why I think other people are having fun, you know? Oh, absolutely. Why do you think I'm here? I, I've been loving it and sharing it. And, and obviously I'm not alone. Um, I'm in the popular crowd because of the millions of views. So <laughs> it's really great stuff. I love it. Thank you. Um, I want to also ask you, um, you spoke about a new movie, so I don't, I don't want to leave any of the juicy tidbits out. Yeah. There's a movie I made with my other uh, collaborator, uh, Dan Simon. It's called Another Year Together. It's actually a Christmas so, sort of uh, romantic dramedy that we shot in New York during Christmas and snowfall several years ago while I still lived there. But it's a beautiful film. Um, you'll be able to see some information about it online if you Google it or looking up on IMDb. But um, that hopefully will be coming out this holiday season, but I'll, I'll of course keep you informed. These feature films can get crazy. I mean, Hudson, I think was shot a couple years before we were able, able, actually able to get it out to people, maybe more. So it's a wild thing to shoot them. And it's the opposite of Greg in LA, right? That, 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 that's the beauty of it is in this business, you're so used to waiting so long for things that to be able to like get that creative fulfillment and get it out to an audience very quickly is like a dream. Uh, I, I'm the type of person that, um, I cannot shut off the deluge of marketing ideas and, and just creative ideas. I can't shut it down. Do you already have like season three in your head, like different, you know, one minute or two minute skits in your head, or is it feel, is it more spontaneous? The, the creative process? Yeah, I, uh, I usually take it from Sean will write down in his notebook a lot of the structure he gets a lot of spontaneous ideas about like the season flow and usually what will happen is Sean will write a structure down based on a conversation I've had with him like I'll notice something about somebody I know and perhaps about like a situation that I've a story that I've based on something I've noticed about something somebody does I'll sort of a story will come into my mind about a circumstance sort of out of nowhere. And then I'll immediately sort of see the scene in my head and then I'll 
I'll tell Sean and I'll talk about it and, you know, we'll tinker with it, but it's very spontaneous and it's very much, we have a very specific process. I don't, I didn't tell you this, but Hudson was primarily improvised the whole thing. Really? Yeah. We have a very special process where we believe that in the, in between spaces, like if the actors are comfortable and they're comfortable with that process, that without even knowing what you're going to say, if you're in character, that magic happens and the whole movie, some of the biggest moments in that movie were just, just spontaneous. And, and Greg in LA about half, I'd say, of what's on there is probably not scripted. It's just things that I say in the moment or spontaneous things that we, we come up with that he just keeps rolling on. And sometimes that'll change the entire episode. We'll just be like, that's better. Mm, yeah. So a lot of improv. Yeah, a ton. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. it's sort of, and yeah. your training wasn't that. It's just inherent in your creative it, process. It was actually. It, it wasn't like I went to improv. The, the school I went to, the Neighborhood Playhouse, was a big uh, theater training school. And it was a man named Sanford Meisner uh, taught there. And there's uh, three main teachers. Meisner, Stan, uh, uh, Stanislavski was like the, the, the main teacher. But, but they brought sort of modern acting Brando to the States. It was Stella Adler, Lee Strasberg, who's in Godfather 2, actually, who won an Oscar, and Sanford Meisner. And they all had different approaches to acting. The, the school I went to was very imagination-based. Strasberg is very much like taking from actual past traumas in your life to draw emotion, which really messed some people up, so they don't mm. really do much anymore. And then Stella Adler was a little mixture of both. And Marlon Brando was a Stella Adler student. But, but Meisner was very much like, two years of you think of a circumstance you have a partner and then in front of the room you come through the door and you just go and you just you just let the scene either fly or die and you feel humiliated and the teacher will stop you and tell you why it was awful or why your instincts were off very old school but that was it pretty much it was almost a like dramatic improv training so it 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 the, the, the demand is that you're ready to react in the moment um, spontaneously based on a combination of being comfortable enough that you're almost not even on stage anymore. You're just sort of there with the person so that it's all based. It was actually all based on like a, uh, if I pinch you, you're going to say, ouch. So mm -hmm. if I say something to you, what's the first thing you want to do? So a lot of it is just training yourself to just react and unlearn all the things that you were taught pretty much growing up, which is, you know, calm yourself down, you know, hold right. yourself think, back. Think before you speak kind of thing. Exactly. Because right? right? it doesn't right? work. So uh, I guess having those instincts ready to go, like, so yeah, it is a form of improv. So it's been nice to be able to wrap that into what I do and sort of find somebody else in Sean that sort of thrives there as well. It's like, we, we kind of attracted each other in a way, you know? And he, and he plays like this kind of slightly creepy dude on Greg in LA, you know, like, oh, well, if you want to get rid of a body, you can just like go to the gas station and leave a shoe and uh, whatever. Oh, David? Oh, God. David, David I'm sorry. David, David is a cat, is a character. He's oh, like, sorry. Sean was the producer. Dave's the actor. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Sean's like the creator. Sorry. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. David, <laughs> you're just meeting these people. David um, <laughs> is, uh, he's one of those guys. Like, he's just David. Like, you just let David go. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how Sean and I cast. Like we cast people on their essence. We don't cast them on being like brilliant, you know, Daniel Day Lewis is because if you let somebody go and you can see their essence, mm -hmm. you, your job is done because there's magic in them just staring. Mm. You know what I mean? And people might get, people get very nervous. I think that of dead space and the things not really coming across, but you know, so much is behavior, right? So mm -hmm. much, everything. Well, a lot could be said in the silence too. Yeah, people, people are just afraid of it. Exactly. <laughs> they don't, they don't like dead spaces, right? For sure. Yeah. I am in my kitchen. I'm always, I'm always thinking that because I need to put music on, mm. but I'm like, oh, it is when it's just quiet and there's a bunch of people, it is, it's calming, but it is something scary about it. Right. Right. Something right. a little bit unnerving. Yeah. People always feel like they need to fill in the space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. Uh, Craig. This is a great conversation. I'm so glad you had me on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming on Coffee Culture. This yeah. was awesome. 
Share your thoughts and ideas on coffee culture. You could put them in the reviews on Apple Podcasts or DM me on Instagram. And if you'd like to support an indie podcaster, there is a link in the show notes for buying me a coffee. Please subscribe and share a cup of coffee culture with your friends. This season is produced by Pale Blue Studios.